Okay. All right. Well, good morning and, and welcome to all of you who are joining us, um, whether you're joining live on Facebook or on Zoom or if you're catching the recording later on. Um, I'm glad you're with us. We, we have some really important stuff to cover today. Um, and in fact, uh, when I woke up this morning, I had an email from UK Now and the UK Now story was all about how the Healing Community Study, so that's uh, HEAL stands for Helping End Addiction Long Term and it's a $90 million grant that the University of Kentucky got, biggest grant in the history of the university um, to reduce, the goal is to reduce overdose deaths. And because of COVID-19, they've had to um, expedite their timeline. And so it was just interesting that on the day that we're presenting all about how COVID-19 has impacted um, this discipline, that there was an article about it. So if you're interested, check that out. And then also, um, when I first logged on, the, um, the podcast that was playing as we waited for people to get on the webinar, um, was about syringe access programs and about harm reduction. And we're gonna talk a little bit about harm reduction strategies during COVID-19, but we're not gonna have a lot of time to unpack it. So if it's something that piques your interest, check out that um, Talking Facts podcast as well. Uh, we're gonna spend most of our time today talking about how COVID-19 impacts people in active addiction and in recovery. We'll talk a little bit about prevention at the end because I still wanna make sure we focus on um, kids just as much as, as adults when it comes to substance use prevention and recovery. Um, and we've got Maria monitoring the chat box, so feel free to send in questions if you've got those. And, um, and then just as, a, as an incentive to keep you around till the end, um, I got some, some swag, some free stuff that, um, that we'll be able to give away at the end, so um, stick around for that. Um, in order to really think about how COVID-19 has impacted people in addiction and recovery, first we need to have an understanding of where we were prior to COVID-19. And if I were to ask you that question, what was the state of uh, substance use prior to COVID-19, hopefully most of you would be able to tell me that it was not good, right? Um, if you remember before COVID-19, it seemed like every UK Now article was about research on opioids, trying to reduce overdose deaths. Um, we had an, a, a public health emergency prior to COVID-19. And so what you're looking at here is a graph of what are called deaths of despair, which are essentially deaths from drugs, alcohol, and suicide. And um, so you notice the green line on the bottom, uh, drug overdose, you see from basically 2010 to 2020, uh, a sharp, sharp increase in overdose deaths. And that's where we found ourselves just as we came into COVID-19. In fact, 2019 had been our first year of hope, the first year where we saw potentially a decrease in overdose deaths year to year, um, which is not reflected on this graph, but it was the first sliver of hope. And of course, that's gonna be undone, all those gains lost by COVID-19. When you combine the impact of all three of these trends, you get the gray graph at the top, which indicates all the deaths of despair. Look at the, the, the um, slope of that graph from about 2000 to 2020, and then compare that historically um, in the United States, the Great Depression, World Wars, never did we see deaths of despair like we've seen today. I think it's fair to say, even prior to COVID-19, we had a really desperate society. And so you may ask yourself, um, where are these desperate people? If you're not one, one of them, you may say, where are these desperate people? I don't see them in my community. It must be somewhere else. Well, think again, because if we look at a heat map of deaths of despair prior to the epidemic, um, take a look at where most of those deaths are occurring. They're right at home, you all. It's right at home. Um, that's really heartbreaking to see. And, and again, this, is the, this heat map was based on a, a study that was published in 2018. So it's probably based on 2017 data, which is to say this is worse. Uh, the reality today is worse than we even see here. So um, I promise you there, there is no bigger um, public health crisis for us, aside from COVID-19, um, other, other than the opioid emergency that we still have. So that was the state of affairs as we came into uh, COVID-19, as we started the, the public health emergency. And um, I want to shift gears for a second and do a quick thought experiment. Um, obviously, I'm not going to have you vocalize any answers, but I just want you to think through this for a second about why we wear face masks. And um, uh, we're, I'm not trying to dive into any controversy or anything, right? We're trying to keep this very surface level. Why we wear face masks? Well, principally, one of the things that I've understood 
from the public health experts is that while we can wear face masks to pre protect ourselves, the research seems to show it's far more effective at protecting other people. That I wear my face mask to protect you, right? To prevent the transmission of the disease. And principally what we're doing is trying to protect vulnerable populations, right? Older adults, people who have chronic diseases, people with substance use disorders, people with mental health conditions. Um, that's why we wear face masks. It's also a form of harm reduction. And I mentioned harm reduction in the beginning. Um, we will talk a little bit more about harm reduction later on. Uh, I don't think, yeah, right now we will. Um, harm reduction is uh, something that um, is something we do in all, all facets of our lives. But for some reason, when we start practicing harm reduction in terms of substance use, people get really uncomfortable. So um, harm reduction is the practice of reducing harm, okay? So in, in the context of, let's say, driving, um, anytime we get behind the wheel of a car, we automatically increase our risk of dying in a car accident by whatever percent, right? It's a, it's, there's an inherent danger in driving a car. That doesn't mean we don't drive cars. Um, we just decide that we're going to we're going to do so as safely as possible, and so we wear seatbelts, right? We can say the same thing about sexual activity and condoms. Abstinence is the only 100% effective way of preventing pregnancy or STIs, um, but that doesn't mean that people uh, don't need to have sex otherwise, right? Um, condoms are an effective way to reduce the harm associated with having sex. Face masks are another example. Unfortunately, when we start talking about harm reduction with substance use. When we talk about things like having naloxone available to reverse an overdose, or we talk about syringe access programs so that people aren't using um, dirty or infected syringes. Um, and these are practices that public health shows are better for everyone in society, not just for people who are using drugs, but it reduces the incidence of HIV and Hep C and all these things across the board. Um, so I say all that to say, uh, this is a time when we're going to need to invest in harm reduction strategies. And so we're going to come back a little bit later on and talk about what that looks like during COVID-19. But I just wanted to use the face mask as a way of wading into those waters where people aren't as uncomfortable, right? Using a face mask as a form of harm reduction makes sense. Using a condom, wearing a seatbelt, they make sense. I think from our perspective, um, working in our discipline, we think all these other harm reduction strategies for substance use make sense as well. So we'll jump in. But before we get there, we want to talk about the vulnerabilities. We said we wear face masks to, to protect vulnerable populations. And make no mistake, there's arguably no more vulnerable a population than people with substance use disorders. So we're going to talk about some of the different ways um, that they're exposed, that they're susceptible. And the first is just physically. They have a physical vulnerability because so many folks with substance use disorders are immunocompromised. Um, because they have other chronic diseases, or because of the high rate of smoking and vaping in, um, in this community. So when looking at the early, early data that's been published out of China based on COVID-19, um, Wu and Magugan found a case fatality rate of 6.3% for people who have chronic respiratory diseases. And you can compare that to an overall case fatality rate of only 2.3%. So in layman's terms, if you have a chronic respiratory disease, you're three times more likely to die from COVID-19. And in China, um, there's a higher mortality rate for men than women. And some researchers are attributing that to the fact that a majority of men in China smoke, while a very, very slim minority of women um, smoke. So what are the implications for people with substance use disorders? Well, the rates of, of smoking and vaping in this community are extraordinarily high. So that presents um, a serious vulnerability. There's also a lot of co-occurring chronic diseases. So things like cardiovascular disease, um, obesity, diabetes are all rampant within the community of people who have substance use disorder, which only prevent, uh, present a, a further vulnerability. In addition to, being, to having a vulnerability in terms of physical health, um, people with substance use disorders also have an economic vulnerability. So, um, just prior to COVID-19, or, or maybe just at the beginning of COVID-19 in January, um, I collected some data from a local outpatient treatment center. And prior to COVID-19, based on that data, um, half of that sample, 48% was unemployed, 75% was living below the federal poverty line, and they had very low recovery capital, which means their access to resources and the things that they need to help them in recovery was very low. Um, 
And I make that point to say that's prior to COVID-19. So you can imagine how those unemployment numbers and um, income levels have, have, have been exacerbated by um, COVID-19. Um, and I should also mention there's a well-documented, um, robust body of evidence that shows a correlation between unemployment and substance use. Um, the more meaningfully employed a person is, the less they use substances. So this just presents a greater concern for this community. Third, and I think most importantly, people with substance use disorders are physiologically vulnerable. And um, if you've heard me do a, an Addiction 101 presentation or one on Recovery Capital, we may have covered this in some sense, but honestly, if you got nothing else out of today's presentation, this is a powerfully important thing to understand. So first, um, it's well documented that people early in recovery have a hypersensitive HPA axis, which is your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It's, that's a fancy, long, obnoxious term. It's basically your fight, flight, or freeze response, right? It's responsible for releasing cortisol and says, hey, I should have a stress response right now. I should fear for my life. That's incredibly adaptive when you're out in the wild, when you need to be fearful of a saber-toothed tiger. But if you're early in recovery, you have this hypersensitive uh, fight or flight response. That means you're going into fight or flight in times when you really shouldn't. That means you're at work and you get a phone call and um, seeing a number come up on your phone you don't recognize causes this hypersensitive, um, exaggerated startle response, almost like you'd see in post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Um, so first of all, we're talking about people who are very sensitive to stress. Um, think about folks early in recovery. I, I guess I can identify. Let me give a personal example. When I was only about a year or 18 months in recovery, um, I applied for graduate school the first time, and it was so maddening and frustrating going through the application process that I almost gave up, almost didn't come here at all, because I think in part due to what a hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity to stress that I had at the time. Um, so in addition to that, the fact that they're just very stressed out, um, you also have brains that have been affected, right? And so when you've heard me do Addiction 101, we get to spend a lot of time unpacking how the brain's impacted. We're not gonna do that today, we don't have time, but basically what happens is when you use drugs over and over again, the pleasure chemical in your brain gets decreased over time. That's dopamine. So you have less and less dopamine available in your brain. And that causes a state of being called anhedonia. Uh, anhedonia means no pleasure. It's, it's the inability to experience pleasure. So through using drugs day in and day out over and over again, people have, people um, lose enough dopamine that their brains are in a place where they can't experience pleasure, okay? So let's, let's pause and pull together all the things we've talked about so far. You have a group of people who have all these physical vulnerabilities because of other chronic diseases, because they smoke, people who are in the worst economic position you can imagine, completely vulnerable. And then you've got people who are stressed out to the max. They don't even have um, the hard wire working properly to cope with stress. And then on top of that, oh yeah, they're miserable because they can't experience the pleasure chemical in their brain, all right? This is the state of being for people early in recovery. And then on top of all of that, I think the straw that breaks the camel's back is now we've taken away one of the most effective and organic ways for people um, to receive support and to get better. And that's social connection. Um, so when you look at research, it's interesting that historically, people with substance use disorders have sought help in groups, right? They've sought help together. Think about Alcoholics Anonymous, think about Synanon, about Celebrate Recovery. Um, sort of the most obvious characteristic of these groups is that they're groups, that they're people coming together to support one another. And um, what research like the article that I've, I've put up here show is by virtue of participating in a group, you see, a reversal of that dopamine downregulation process that I just mentioned. So essentially, your brain upregulates dopamine. So what does that mean? Um, essentially, in in layman's terms, when you have social interactions, you're you're naturally healing your brain. You're naturally reversing the effects of addiction on the brain. Um, and that's why, at a time when we have social distancing guidelines that force people apart, that um, deprive people of social interactions, it's really, really scary. And it's really, really scary for a population that already has this giant list of vulnerabilities during COVID-19. So that's the state 
what do we expect to happen? Uh, Wellbeing Trust is a think tank, um, and based on their projections, they're estimating 75,000 um, deaths of despair due to COVID-19. So it's, it's helpful to um, distinguish that we're not talking about COVID-19 deaths. We're not talking about people contracting the disease and dying. We're talking about collateral damage. We're talking about people who die during COVID-19 consequent to it, whether that's because of economic consequences or social consequences, um, overdose, suicide, whatever that is, 75,000 additional deaths. So that's a war that we're gonna fight and a war's worth, an army's worth of, um, of casualties that we'll likely sustain in that projection. So what are we actually seeing? That's merely a projection. What we're actually seeing, um, it's important to note, is not based on peer-reviewed data. We don't have any, to my knowledge, peer-reviewed data on the recovery community during this time. Um, we, at, at Voices of Hope, we're undertaking some research right now, doing some interviews with folks in recovery, trying to understand how COVID-19 has impacted their experience. But as of now, all we have to go off of is some very preliminary data from uh, health departments, and then what we call anecdotal data, which is essentially anecdotes, um, stories that I'm hearing from stakeholders in the community. And what we're seeing are increases in virtually every indicator of despair. More people using, we're seeing more people relapsing or returning to use, a sharp, very concerning increase in overdose, an increase in suicide. I can tell you um, personally, just within our community at our nonprofit, um, we've lost multiple members of our community to overdose in the last two months and multiple members to suicide in the last two months. Um, I was on a, uh, a call on a, a webinar um, on Monday with some other health and human service providers in Lexington, one of whom was a woman who works at Greenhouse 17, works with victims of domestic violence. And um, she noted a sharp, sharp increase in incidents of interpersonal violence, intimate partner violence, um, we talked in the last webinar, people have been surprised that we declared liquor stores essential, right? People are saying, well, why is it that I can't go to the gym or go to a restaurant, but people can go buy liquor? And part of the reason for that is because it is the single most important public health measure we can take right now to leave liquor stores open, and that's not a joke. Um, we have about 14 and a half million people who are actively addicted to alcohol right now, and withdrawals from alcohol can actually threaten your life. It can actually kill you. So the run on emergency rooms that we would have were we to have um, no access to liquor stores would, would, would overwhelm healthcare far beyond that of COVID-19, right? Um, so it, it, it's almost a public health measure, if nothing else. And then from uh, May 1st to May 4th, in a three-day span, Bourbon County reported 11 overdoses, and Frankfurt uh, reported about the same number of overdoses, and there were multiple overdose deaths at each site. And to put that into context for you, I went back and looked at the latest um, overdose fatality report. In 2018, Bourbon County had six overdose deaths. Um, in this three-day span, Bourbon County had 11 overdoses and multiple deaths. So there's no question that what we're seeing is a desperate community. Um, I'm going to put up a trigger warning here. I, I'm about to show um, some photographs of some drugs that have contributed to these overdoses. And uh, just in case we had anybody on the call who's in recovery or maybe just isn't in a good place today, um, now might be the time to just take a break. We'll only be on this slide for about a minute and then we'll come back. So um, take that opportunity now. I'm gonna go ahead and change the slide. So what you're looking at here look exactly like prescription pills. The pills on the left are um, Percocet, look like a Percocet 30, which is essentially uh, oxycodone with a cinnamethan. It's an opioid. Um, the pill on the right looks a lot like a Xanax bar, a two milligram Xanax bar, which is a, a benzodiazepine, an anti-anxiety medication. But in fact, it's not those things at all. What you're looking at is pure, unadulterated fentanyl, which is part of what's been killing um, so many people. It's sort of responsible for the third wave of the opioid epidemic. And it's particularly concerning because you might have folks who have been using these pills, a Percocet or Xanax, um, for a long time and might have a pretty good understanding of how it affects them and how much they can take. Um, and when they think they're taking that and they're taking fentanyl instead, um, it's possible that that's also what's contributing to overdoses. So it's something to be aware of. Um, and then the other thing that we're actually seeing that you, 
you probably can't have any discussion about such a vulnerable, marginalized population without talking about barriers. Because to my knowledge, there's no group that experiences the barriers this group experiences. To begin with, it's already the most stigmatized condition on the planet. And that's not an exaggeration. That's uh, based on research. The World Health Organization did a study a few years back um, examining what are the most stigmatized conditions. And um, substance use disorder or drug addiction and alcohol use disorder or alcohol addiction were first and fourth most stigmatized um, respectively. So you have an already very stigmatized condition. You already have a group of people who aren't necessarily welcomed in emergency room or, or clinical settings. And then when you add to that, that during this national emergency, we're trying to keep healthcare spaces open for COVID-19 patients, um, it can bring a lot of stigma on people with substance use disorders who seek care. Because if I show up at an ER and I'm addicted or I'm intoxicated, the feeling is, look at the bed that you're wasting that someone who contracted COVID-19 through no fault of their own should have. But wouldn't you know it, it's likely that a lot of those folks with substance use disorders who are going to be filling those beds are there because of COVID-19. Not because they contracted it, but because of all those socioeconomic, psychosocial vulnerabilities, right? Um, also, we don't, in general, we don't do, uh, at least as a community here, we don't do withdrawal management for anything other than alcohol or benzodiazepines. So withdrawal management means, um, at least medical withdrawal management, is using medication to ease withdrawal symptoms, right? Um, with alcohol and benzodiazepines, as I mentioned earlier, it can actually threaten your life. You can actually die from those withdrawals. Um, so it's medically necessary to manage those withdrawals. For people who are, let's say, addicted to opioids like heroin, um, it feels like you're gonna die, right? But you can't actually die from the, the withdrawal itself. Um, so what this means is we have a lot of folks who um, are experiencing the symptoms of withdrawal, but aren't able to access um, any type of management to ease those symptoms. Uh, and then a little word about treatment. I've been on a couple of webinars the past few weeks about the ways that the Fed has changed um, guidelines surrounding the prescribing of medications for opioid use disorder. So whether that's Suboxone uh, or uh, buprenorphine or methadone or Vivitrol. Um, and they're, they're, it's not really relevant to you all as much, but uh, there are just a lot of ways that they've made some pretty drastic changes that are interesting. So for instance, um, Typically, folks on methadone have to go and get a it's, have to go and get a daily dose from the clinic. It's arguably the most tightly controlled substance, um, unlike buprenorphine or suboxone, where people get take-home doses. Well, the Fed has actually changed prescribing practices and is allowing folks to have take-home methadone doses, which is wonderful because it allows people to treat their disease from the comfort of their home, but it also presents um, a, a serious overdose risk. Um, for people who, who could overdose on methadone. There are barriers to housing for people who are uh, experience housing insecurity. Um, the last I checked, there are no new admissions to homeless shelters. Um, in fact, one of our local emergency shelters actually was forced to move, to my understanding, all of the men who were staying in the emergency shelter out to um, Garrett County, out to a rural space. And so just imagine if you're a person who has depended on that shelter and its surrounding resources for your survival for the last five or 10 years, and all of a sudden, without your permission, you're sort of coerced to moving um, out into a rural area. Um, you can imagine how that could dismantle somebody's life. Um, and a, a shout out to Transylvania University. My understanding is that they stepped up to help the Hope Center house some folks. Um, and, and I appreciate that. Then we have issues with folks who are being released from incarceration. So you may have seen that Governor Bashir, um, I, I think it was by executive order, I'm not sure, mandated the release of some low level, primarily people who had drug offenses, um, which again, I think is a huge victory. Probably they didn't need to be incarcerated in the first place. Um, but regardless, what we know is that when people leave incarceration, that is the single um, high, highest risk moment for overdose that your, your risk of overdose increases any time you've had a sustained period of sobriety. Um, so when people leave treatment or leave incarceration, they're most vulnerable to overdose because their tolerance has come down, but they may try to take a dose that they previously took when their tolerance was higher and it affects them differently. Um, that's part of the reason why the HEAL team in the article that I mentioned at the very beginning 
uh, part of the reason why they're expediting their study because they're trying to get more naloxone out into communities for fear of a rash of overdoses that may come from people who are addicted, who were incarcerated and have been released without meaningful support. You also have issues with reentry. You have folks who are being released from jail and can't go to a DMV, can't get a license, can't get um, identification or documentation. And you know, how are you gonna get a job when you're already um, have gaps in your employment history, you have a criminal record, you just left prison, oh, now you don't have an ID, right? I mean, it's, um, it's an incredible, overwhelming number of barriers. Uh, I, I won't spend much time at all talking about treatment, but it's worth noting that treatment centers were put on lockdown uh, as a part of the shelter in place order. And I, again, know personally of some folks who left treatment um, against medical advice during that period. I, I think due to the pressure of being forced into that space. Um, and so strangely enough, during this time, the National Institute of Drug Abuse is recommending people use outpatient services instead of inpatient services, because research shows that inpatient isn't necessarily better than outpatient. And so given um, all things being equal, it's, it's better to keep people from coming into um, inpatient stay where they could be uh, exposed to COVID-19. So what can we do? Um, we, we, I mentioned harm reduction earlier, and I think this is a time when harm reduction is uh, gonna grow and gonna, gonna um, gain some steam. And hopefully there'll be less opposition because we're already engaging in other forms of harm reduction like wearing face masks, right? So one of the things we know is that using alone, um, particularly using opioids alone, um, increases your risk of experiencing a fatal overdose. So if you're using opioids, you do not use alone. If you're using opioids, do not use alone. I recognize that what we are telling you to do is to defy the social distancing order, but that is not coming from me. That is coming from uh, Nora Volkov, who's the top addiction scientist in the United States, the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And essentially what she's saying is, um, if you're using opioids, and particularly if you're using in a high risk way, if you're injecting opioids, for instance, um, your drug use presents a greater threat to your health and well-being than does COVID-19, right? A more urgent threat. Um, so do not use alone. Um, you know, getting Narcan is something that I hope that I mention on every webinar always. Um, and that's not only if you're a person with a substance use disorder, not only if you're a family member of someone, um, even if your loved one doesn't use opioids, or even if you don't have anyone in your life that you know of who has a substance use disorder, it's still worth carrying Narcan. Um, I almost used Narcan to revive somebody in the um, UK parking garage last year. And our very own governor, Governor Bashir, actually pulled someone overdosing out of a vehicle a year or two ago um, prior to the election. So um, it can happen to anybody at any time, right? That you could be in a place where someone could be overdosing in a gas station, bathroom, whatever it is, and you can literally save a life. They call it the Lazarus drug because it raises people from the dead. You could also consider a new app that's been developed called Canary. And uh, it's pretty cool. Essentially what it does, my understanding is it sends push notifications to people while they're using, um, such that if they don't respond to the notification, it can alert either an emergency contact or um, 911, and they can respond um, and potentially save a life. Um, and, and another thing that was suggested to me on a, a harm reduction discussion I had recently was using FaceTime while people are, are using drugs. And um, look, you all, I know that for some folks, it's like, what the heck are we talking about here? Are we trying to encourage drug use? Um, I am not trying to encourage drug use. I'm trying to encourage safe drug use. What I'm trying to encourage is um, safer communities, safer families, right? Um, and, and FaceTime is one effective way of being able to monitor someone while they're using for at least uh, you know, 30 minutes or an hour to ensure that they don't fall out. Um, and this is just a way that we protect people we care about, right? In addition to harm reduction, I think finding support is probably the most vital aspect for, for people in recovery. Uh, number one, because it's widely available. Support is out there. It's free. We can get to it. We just have to get people connected. And so what we're seeing now that I think is maybe a silver lining from the way COVID-19 has impacted this community is that maybe we're going to see a lot more virtual support groups going forward which could be pretty cool because they have a lot of advantages over having to get in your car 
and drive out, um, you know, to, to wherever a, an AA meeting or a 12 step meeting or, or support group may be. Um, so there are a variety of groups available. You can um, access not just 12 step meetings, but faith based meetings, non denominational meetings, secular meetings, um, based on all, all sorts of different approaches. And research shows us um, that it decreases a sense of isolation and increases support, makes people feel connected. Um, so I'll put this back up again. This is a resource I included in the last webinar as well. Um, and if you, if you want uh, to, to share this on your Facebook or social media or anything like it, just reach out to me and I can send you this or related materials. I think if even one person on your timelines saw this, and went to one of these websites and, and got connected with recovery support, you, you might have saved someone's life. And I know that's so kitschy and cliche, but that's just, that's just the reality of the way this stuff works. Um, we're, we're drawing a little closer to the end of our time, um, but I, I do think it's important to talk a little bit about how prevention efforts have been impacted. Um, because, as our friend Benjamin Franklin says, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Certainly, I'd much rather keep somebody from ever going down this road to begin with. Um, so what does that look like in the context of COVID-19? Well, we know that there is a long, long list of risk factors for substance use, right? When, when you ask the question, why does a person choose to use drugs or why does a person begin using drugs? It's, a, it's an extraordinarily complicated um, array of factors that contribute, right? But what I've included here are the risk factors that I think will also be impacted by COVID-19. So for instance, one of the biggest risk factors for becoming addicted later in life is called age of onset. So it's essentially how old were you when you started using any kind of substance? And that includes, by the way, nicotine. Um, and there's a, there's, there's a cutoff for some reason about 13, 14 years old. So kids who um, begin using after 14 years old are far less likely to become addicted than kids who begin using before. Um, but with kids being at home, with kids having more access to medicine cabinets, more access to mom and dad's tobacco, more access to maybe just running around with friends. I don't know that people are doing that during social distancing, but it seems possible that we would see kids experimenting at an earlier age. Also, we know that family conflict is um, a leading cause of youth substance use. In family systems, sometimes we talk about how children act as safety valves for the family, that when there's too much pressure and too much conflict building, that a lot of times kids will act out and be the ones to sort of relieve the pressure. Um, and sometimes that looks like substance use. That's, that's the form of acting out. Um, so certainly during this time when we're seeing an increase in all this, this kind of desperation, all this economic strife, an increase in intimate partner violence, it seems possible that we're gonna see an increase in family conflict, which may lead kids to be more likely to try to cope with substances. There's an interesting, long, robust correlation between academic success and low substance use. So kids who show a lack of commitment to school are much more likely to use substances. And if in the middle of my semester, you told me I had to go online and stop seeing my friends, and that might threaten my commitment to my schooling, right? So I am concerned with how moving school online has impacted kids academically and the relationship that has to substance use. I, I sort of already alluded to the high availability of substances. Just by virtue of kids not being in school in a controlled environment, um, you know, if, if kids are at home and parents are having to work or whatever it is, they may have greater access to substances. We also know, and this one I think is intriguing, um, a community level risk factor is community disorganization. And generally what that means is we're talking about low income, low SES communities that don't have um, solidarity, don't have a good sense of community, um, a good sense of community safety. Uh, but think about how COVID-19 has impacted us. I went on a walk this morning and um, man, and I know we're all just trying to be safe, but people will cross to the other side of the street so they don't pass you. I feel like they're not nodding or waving as if their wave is gonna contaminate them. Um, I think what we're experiencing is disorganization in our community, which is, the research tells us, a risk factor for kids to use drugs, for kids to experiment. And then the last one, um, whenever kids experience transitions in their lives, whether that's um, a developmental transition, maybe going through puberty or going from 
elementary school to middle school or middle school to high school or whatever it is, these transitions are particularly risky periods for substance use, but it could also be transitions in their day-to-day -day lives. So for instance, COVID-19, totally changing, disorienting everything about what you do, it requires an adjustment. And um, when people look to cope, they can cope in all sorts of ways. They may cope in, in adaptive ways, like, um, like we suggested in the last webinar. Maybe they're doing their deep breathing and, and using their meditation beads, um, or maybe they're using substances, which is a way to cope, but a maladaptive way to cope. Um, so the point being here, most of the factors that we know predict whether or not a kid is gonna use substances are being impacted and are being increased during this time. So maybe it's a time to double down on your conversation with your kids about substances. Maybe it's a time to keep a watchful eye, increase your parental monitoring, a um, number of things to consider. I told you I was gonna, you know, I had a little gift for you at the end. It's actually not from me, but um, this week is actually National Prevention Week. Uh, and so as a part of that, I wanted to, to, to offer some reminders about prescription safety. Since kids will have more access to prescription drugs during this time, it's important for us to think about how um, we can be, be safer about that. What harm reduction looks like. Hey, how about this? I didn't think about this. This is harm reduction, right? Um, your kids could get into your medicine cabinet. That doesn't mean you don't keep medicine in the house anymore, right? That's crazy. You need medicine. It just means you do it safely. Harm reduction. It all comes full circle. Um, so make sure you keep track of your prescriptions and in particular prescriptions that have high abuse potential. So it, we are talking about opioids, like the Percocet I showed you previously. Um, this could include benzodiazepines, like the, the Xanax that I showed you, or Valium. Um, make sure you have a, a good idea of, of how many of those you should have and have them stored away. When you have unused medications, you know, many of us have a surgery, we get 30 Percocet and we only need three of them. So you've got 27 highly addictive opioid pills in your medicine cabinet. If you're, not gonna, if you're not gonna use them as prescribed as a part of that recovery, get rid of them. Don't keep them because you think you might use them later. Don't, don't keep them in case you get a bad headache one day. Get rid of them because that's one of the risk factors for kids in your home um, overdosing, but also just being exposed to opioids. Um, and so you can take them to drug take back uh, at police departments, at some health departments, I think. But um, if you're looking to stay quarantined while um, practicing some of your pre prevention harm reduction, you can go to deterrasystem.com slash safe and get a large deterra pouch for free. And uh, deterra pouches have uh, a chalky substance in them that um, disintegrates the, the, the pill. So if you got some pills, you, you pop them down in the bag, disintegrates them, they they're not, don't have the same abuse potential anymore. And I want to kind of leave, we're kind of to our last couple slides here. I just wanted to leave with a little bit of hope because one of the things that I appreciate about, uh, about extension in general and about FCS extension is that, um, that, that there's optimism there, that what we focus on is strengths-based, um, not deficit-based, right? We focus on how to help people be healthier, um, which is something that we can all get behind and it's optimistic and it's hopeful. Um, unfortunately, sometimes I feel like being a specialist for substance use, I like I'm a little bit of a bummer, right? I'm the guy who has to talk about deaths of despair. Um, so I think it's important to always inject hope into the conversation. So this is pretty cool. This is a study I just read about recently um, where researchers uh, took a group of folks who'd been hospitalized for suicidal ideation. These are folks who had a, a serious suicidal crisis and researchers divided them into two groups. One group received four or five handwritten letters from physicians at that hospital over the next few years. And the other group did not receive any letters. And what the researchers found is the group that received these handwritten notes were less likely um, to die by suicide every single year. In fact, there was a statistically significant difference, um, which means, which tells us connection makes a difference. Reaching out to people makes a difference. And I put up the picture of the note because I wanted you to see how simple this connection was. The note says, in case you can't read it, it says, Dear John, it's been some time since you were here at the hospital and we hope things are going well for you. If you wish to drop us a note, we would be glad to hear from you. Best, Susan. It's a simple note. She wrote this man two sentences, right? But these notes actually had a, a statistical difference in preventing suicide. People need connection, you all. We need connection. And uh, during this time, more than ever, we have to find ways to get connected.
Last thing I'm going to leave you with, I hate putting lots of text up on the screen, but um, I, I just think this is a brilliant way to talk about. So as I was preparing for this webinar, obviously I've been reading lots of information about how COVID-19 has impacted um, people with substance use disorders. And I read an article written by a guy named William White, who's one of my favorite writers and thinkers on addiction. And I want to read this to you. And, and I want us to think about it for just a second as we close. William White writes, recent articles and commentaries have highlighted these vulnerabilities, all these vulnerabilities that we've talked about so far, right? But there's a larger, less told story. The remarkable resilience of people in recovery and communities of recovery as they face the threats posed by the pandemic. So consider this. People in recovery are turning the threats of the pandemic into opportunities for reflection, growth, and service to others. They're on the front lines battling this epidemic in their roles as physicians, nurses, allied health professionals, police officers, first responders, postal workers, bus drivers, farmers, grocery and food delivery workers, National Guard members, and numerous other essential service roles. They're donating money, they're sewing masks, they're volunteering, they're checking in with isolated family members and friends, they're providing social support to the most vulnerable members of our community. Yes, some people will become sick. Yes, some people will die. Yes, we need to support them and mourn those we've lost. We also need to recognize and honor the resilience and the courage of those giving back at the height of this pandemic. And we need to celebrate how communities of recovery are adapting. And the reason I love this so much is not just because it's positive and optimistic, which can feel contrived and kind of hokey, but it's because of this, because William White says, oh, you wanna know how people in recovery are being impacted? Well, hey, they're physicians, they're nurses, they're, I love this because this is a point that I try to make to a lot of folks, and I overlooked it today in putting this together. I forgot that when we're talking about people with substance use disorders, people in recovery, we're also just talking about people because there are doctors with substance use disorders and lawyers and police officers and nurses and postal workers. And so I, th I thought it was kind of a helpful way of zooming back out. We talked about the desperation of this community. We talked about the ways this community is affected, some of the things that can be done. But at the end of the day, let's not forget that really it's just uh, people. These are people in our community and they're people who are impacted the same way as you and I. And just like you and I, we're all looking for ways to cope. Um, so I'd like to leave us just thinking about what does it look like for me to connect with someone today, right? Um, outside the context of what you would normally do in your day. So if you have a Zoom call, call schedule, let's not count that. But what does it look like to, to take one action to try to reach out to someone um, just to make a connection, just like these simple letters, right? That's all I've got for today. Um, if you have uh, questions in, in the chat box, um, I'm sure Maria will bring those up now. If not, if you have questions of a more like personal nature, uh, more private nature, always I put up my email at the end in case you want to inquire about those. Um, and if not, then I hope you all have the best kind of day. Uh, Mindy or Maria, do we have any uh, questions? Do we know? We have lots and lots of comments that are telling us how um, wonderful the information is that you're sharing. And Good. people say you are not um, for this, this um, bleak topic, perhaps. Yeah. So, so don't think you're a bummer, Alex. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good. Um, I also wanted to say that the graphic that you shared, um, that we'll post that on the Facebook page. Excellent. And so that will be available to people. We can also um, send that out to agents. Um, and if people who are not connected with the um, University of Kentucky community want to send an email to UKFCSEXT at UKY.edu, then we can send them uh, all of these resources if, if that would be helpful. Excellent. And we will have this uh, pr presentation, uh, of course, will be available on recording on the Facebook uh, page, but also um, we will have it on our YouTube channel as well. I am not seeing any uh, questions. Um, and I don't think I see any on the Facebook page either. I do want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, Next week on Monday, our session will be on uh, with uh, Kentucky Educational Television on their Bright by Text program. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a great resource for parents who are maybe new parents or maybe experienced parents or um, like me, 
a grandparent who has a sleeping baby in her arms. Um, so we hope that you will join us um, on Monday at 11. Um, I have nothing further. If you have nothing further, Alex, I think we are ready to um, close out. I think we're good to go. It actually looks like there's Oops. a question. Oh, sorry. Did we miss one? Um, sorry, I'm trying to pull it up. It's from Ellen. Yes. What are deaths of despair beyond OD and suicide? Mm. There, that's a great question. They're typically tabulated that way. We also talk about um, accidental or preventable deaths. So deaths of despair are, are generally considered deaths that are unnecessary, right? They're deaths that are not resulting from a condition or a natural cause. Um, but primarily we are only talking about suicide or deaths from, from drug or alcohol overdose. Thank you very much. All right, thanks everybody. And we hope to see you again soon. Go make a friend today. Go make a connection. Exactly. Have a good day. Well, I'm not getting any sound. Okay, thanks everybody, and I'm going to shut us down. <laughs>